Sean hit me and said, how close are we to seeing revenue sharing from conferences to players? Will it happen this year? I don't think it'll happen this year, Sean, but we are very close to seeing it happen. Uh, You've seen Ross Dellinger, I think, do phenomenal reporting on this. Uh, Pete Thamel, as we're recording, had a report last night that the college football powers that be are deep in discussions on settling a very high-profile lawsuit that's out there. I won't bore you with a lot of the intricacies, but I'll explain it in a second. And with that settlement would come revenue sharing with players. So when I was out at the Rose Bowl for Bama, Texas, the night before the game, you normally run into a lot of high-profile people, authoritative people in the sport when we're at those games. And I did. And I had um, pretty lengthy talks that convinced me something really big was coming on this front. Okay, this is one of the things I was talking about. So I went to Twitter and I said, I've never been more convinced radical change is coming to this sport and it's not going to take long. It's going to be this year, like this upcoming 2024, we'll hear it. And this is one of the things like unequivocally, one of the things that I expected to happen is fundamental alteration in what the rules are, how this sport is governed, and the whole revenue-sharing model that was once just this faraway fantasy. It's going to be reality. It's going Maybe not this year, Sean, but we're not waiting five or ten years for this. Like, it's going to be reality pretty quick. So here's what's happening. If you're, if you're bored and don't care about the legalese, just know this. Here's what matters for you as a fan. There is a case, it's House versus NCAA, and it's basically a lot of players, it's a class action lawsuit, it's a lot of players that are claiming because federal courts have ruled that NCAA bylaws were illegal, these players are saying, wait, well that means when we played, we should have been allowed to profit off of our name, image, and likeness, but these these faux rules kept us from doing it, and since you guys, the courts, are saying it was always illegal, We should be able to retroactively collect money. Boom, class action lawsuit. No different than a diet pill lawsuit. It just happens to be the NCAA that is um, in the crosshairs. And really the Power Five conferences are in the crosshairs. So right now, if that thing were to go to court and go the length, go the distance, you would have the Power Five conferences on the hook for like four to five billion dollars in damages. Spoiler alert, no one can afford that. They're not interested in taking it the distance. They're interested in settling. So the feeling right now is there will be a settlement. We did a segment on this like two months ago. It's the first time I've talked about it since then. I I felt then and I feel overwhelmingly now there will be a settlement here and the ending will still start with a B. It'll still be billions, but maybe billion instead of billions. Here's where the rubber meets the road. Okay, for anyone who looks at NIL right now and thinks, man, this thing's out of control. Let's get some guardrails and, and this and that. The NCAA can't do that for you. The only thing that could do that for you is proactively getting in the business of treating players as employees and then also getting some congressional help so that you can actually enforce some rules. So the hope, and there are are several I's to dot and T's to cross here, and I'm not a lawyer and I don't pretend to be, but just to give you a heads up on where we are on this, the revenue sharing model is coming. So basically think about it like this. When, when the gavel hits the table and this settlement is finalized and the dust settles, the leaders of college football are hoping that they can bake into that this. They look across the table and say, all right, we are making concessions. We're going to agree to enter into revenue sharing with the players. So if you're a tight end at Nebraska or you're a wide receiver at Florida State or you're a defensive lineman at Alabama, because you play in the conference you play in, You're entitled to this money every year. We're giving you some of the media rights money that you help us generate. All right, that's simple enough. But they're not done. Since we're giving you that, we want concessions on your end. Since we're giving, 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 and this may be an employment contract or not, but whatever the case may be, they want to then look at Congress and say, see, see, we got our house in order. Okay, we got our act together. Now we need you guys to help us and give us antitrust exemption so that we can actually make some rules and enforce them and you don't slap our hand every time we do it. Now, you said we, we had a mess we needed to clean up. Well, look, we cleaned it up. We cleaned some of it up. So now what are you going to do for us? And the strategy at that point is cross your fingers and hope. Keep in mind, you're hoping that Congress works for you. Um, not uh, the boldest of strategies historically, but that's the hope right now. Um, The other question is, what can you afford? 
What can you afford to pay players? What can conferences afford to pay players? Because there's, you know, there's reporting out there. Dellinger, Ross Dellinger at Yahoo Sports has done a really good job of laying out the fact that you could be looking at 15 to 20 million dollars as sort of a quasi payroll that you can use to pay players. I was reading Shannon Terry stuff from on three a second ago, and he said, "Yeah, but that's not going to mean that NIL goes away." And he's right. As currently constructed, there is no world that just because Ole Miss can pay 15 or $17 million a year that they can't also have a booster go and pay a quarterback 1.5 on the side. No one can stop them from doing that. So the NIL thing doesn't totally go away, which means the disproportionate advantage and the pay-for-play doesn't go away. So that problem's not solved unless you get the antitrust built in. And even then, like, how can you prove all that? So you've got that. But here's the more important fundamental question. Who can spend what? The SEC is going to be able to spend a whole heck of a lot more than everyone else. The Big Ten is the only other one that's going to be able to spend a whole heck of a lot more than everyone else that that compares to the SEC. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, oh, it's always been like that. Not like this. Not legally. Not like this. It won't be. This is codified into law. This is codified into official university and conference stance and bylaw that you're going to be paid a revenue share of playing in this conference. And if you play in the SEC, you're in a more valuable conference than the ACC or the Big 12. Therefore, you're going to make a lot more. It's always been the case that the better players on average are going to those schools in those conferences, but it will never have the volume turned up to 11 like it will now, which brings me to my next point. I have many of you ask me every week, do you think the SEC and the Big Ten are ever going to break away? And I keep telling you guys privately, and I'll answer it publicly, they're doing it now. You just don't realize it's happening because there's not some gigantic press release. There won't be breaking news that tomorrow at 11 a.m., Tony Petiti and Greg Sankey will hold a joint press conference where they announce, we're out. Ladies and gentlemen, we're gone. They don't have to. All they have to do if they want to break away is let this climate exist for three or four years And the revenue disparity alone will so thoroughly detach them, not to mention the media rights, it will so thoroughly detach them from the rest of the sport that it will already be unrecognizable. You look at them play, you look at the others play, it'll already be unrecognizable. They're already detaching themselves. So, yes, it's it's happening now, maybe just not in the exact manner you pictured it in your mind. So, this doesn't answer everything. I do think it's a step in, from this point forward, the right direction. Like, I'm not crazy about the idea that we got here, but having been here for a little while, I'd much prefer this world. It won't be without uh, figurative casualties. Like, I've I've had the G5 folks coming at me this week because I said, you guys should get in front of this and have your own playoff. You're not going to be affiliated with this thing unless it's purely out of the kindness of their hearts. So you're you're either counting on the, the power four and really the power two to look upon you with sympathy and continue to subsidize you, or you're done. You're going to die on the vine. You don't have a great shot either way, but at least if you take your fate into your own hands and try and do your own thing, at least you've got a shot. That's how I think. But you, look, if you're a G5 fan, you disagree with me, fine. Have it your way. Like, I don't... That was its whole sidebar this week, where G, like UAB fans... Uh, South Alabama fans coming at me saying, why do you want to relegate us? You're already relegated. There's nothing that changes that. It's only going to be exclamated further, and you'll only be further detached in this new world. Your leaders understand that. That's why they're floating these ideas out there. I'm just looking at the ideas and saying, we should have done this a long time ago for competitive purposes. We we should have done this long before you came to this conclusion just because you're not going to make enough money anymore. So... If you guys will just make me a billionaire, if that's all you got to do, just make me a billionaire, I'll subsidize the G5. You think I hate them? I'd show you how much I don't hate them. I'd go subsidize them where they don't need to lean on these fools, where they can go do their own thing. Uh, and by the way, one, one other person asked me, if, if UAB were to break away now, if they were to have their own playoff, then you'd never talk about them. I never talk about them now, not because I don't care about them, because you don't care about them. I I swear to you, I'd love to mix in G5 segments every show, but if our mission statement is talk about what people care about, and we do G5 content, and it completely craters, that's a disingenuous approach to putting a show together for an audience. 
I'd be more likely to talk about you if you were in your own postseason system that would be entertaining and it would be watched and, and we could actually talk about it because you'd actually have a shot to win a title. Like, that would be fun. But I digress. I digress. Have it your way. And I know that sounds like it's, it's a tangent. It's all tied into this because the disparity that this world will create is something there's no coming back from. Um, that sucks, but that's a part of this. And the sooner folks face that, the better off they'll be.